Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech .com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. Hopefully, you're having an amazing day. We have a couple of very interesting news stories to get through in this video, but I'd like to start things out with AMD and the Ryzen 4000 series and the Zen 3 architecture because there is a rather massive rumor that has been floating around for the last day or so and it all comes down to the process which AMD will be leveraging for Zen 3. It's been commonly thought that AMD will be using an enhanced version of the 7NM process. Indeed, even if you go back to the end of Q1, AMD put out a roadmap which stated much the same thing. Zen 3, of course, will be the successor to Zen 2. It will bring numerous IPC gains that we've discussed several times in the past. It looks like it's a 10 to 20% jump, really depending on the workload, and there will naturally be a small modest bump in clock frequency although core count will remain identical so for example the 4950x will have 16 cores 32 threads and so on and so on down the product stack but this may be actually based on old information at least according to the node and that is uh, all thanks to a digi times report which actually was released today. And it was uh, translated by the retired engineer on Twitter, Chia. So give your thanks to him in the comments below. Now, this report, I would like to really stress, is not based on my own information and it is not based on official information. However, DigiTimes do have good sources within TSMC. If I were you, I would take this with several grains of salt, and we'll discuss why in just a moment. But let's read the first few sentences. TSMC's enhanced 5NM process enters mass production in Q4, ahead of schedule. AMD's new Ryzen is the first to adopt. PC competitive landscape may usher in the biggest change in 15 years. And rumour has it that AMD and TSMC have adjusted their foundry blueprints. The 4000 series of desktop process originally was expected to launch end of 2020, but will now use TSMC's enhanced 5NM process, which is 5NM Plus, instead of 7NM EUV, clearly demonstrating AMD is now considered a tier 1 customer for TSMC. I won't read out all of this, but another key sentence is AMD's New generation of Ryzen 4000 series, codenamed Vermeer, originally planned to use 7nm EUV and to be unveiled in September October. But in line with the mass production schedule for TSMC's enhanced 5nm process, we will only see the launch of these CPUs at the end of this year or potentially in January 2021. And then it goes on to, of course, point out how the 5NM process from TSMC is coming along rather nicely, with obviously customers such as Apple being rather happy with it. The yields are also pretty damn good as well, and have been for some time um, with the 5NM process. So at least in terms of feasibility, in terms of production, it's not out of the realms of potential. Like, it could be done in terms of the actual feasibility of producing the silicon. There's a rather handy guide, which I've used in several videos in the past, from Wikichip, which basically goes into the roadmap of the TSMC process and how they stack up against one another. Now, it is imperative to realise that these uh, numbers are from very basic chips. They are not necessarily a design as complicated as, let's say, a high-end processor, high-end CPU. So the performance gains may be less, they may be more, but they serve at least as a rough guide. And well, you can see yourself that just shifting from 7NM+, Plus, which was, of course, once again, the original target, to base 7NM is 15% better in terms of performance, but 30% better in terms of power saving. But if this report is accurate, and I stress if, it seems to be using the enhanced version of TSMC's 5NM process, which provides even better performance and even better power savings. So, as always, I'm going to be as balanced as I can be and give you the 
Well, it could be happening, but also give you the reasons it may not be happening. So let's start with the it could be. It does line up with a couple of very interesting things. The first is there have been rumours for some time that AMD have been provisioning a lot of 5NM capability. The second thing is that we've been hearing a lot, of course, although not officially, of the Ryzen 3000 series Matisse refresh. That's not exactly a new architecture in terms of excitement, but still a modest increase in performance thanks to higher clock frequency. We don't know if there's any fundamental changes to the architecture, like tweaks to the CCXs or cores. It doesn't look like there is, but either way, it's a slightly higher clock frequency, probably just a way for AMD to get a product out there. Furthermore, when uh, the press, including myself, were being briefed of the B550 platform and the 3100 and the 3300. They made it abundantly clear that the AM4 platform, which is of course what Zen 2 as well as Zen 3 use, is not necessarily going to be abandoned in 2021. And this is contrary to pretty much the messaging earlier where originally they said that the platform was going to be supported up until 2020. So basically they've kind of implied that there would be something released in 2021 or at the very least they would still be supporting the platform and that is not the same thing as admitting that Zen 3 would launch the year but you know it's at the very least kind of hinting that there's a potential that we would see products release in 2021. So, what about the other side of the coin? Well, for one, AMD's own internal roadmaps up until Q1, um, remember there was the investors conference and they kind of gave all of the information of what they were working on, said that Zen 3 like always, we've known this for some time, would be using an enhanced version of um, 7NM, which would essentially mean that their roadmaps have been inaccurate. Then again, it's a positive change, so I don't think investors would exactly be mad at them, but that's something to be aware of. The second issue is that this is not just a case of copy and paste into, you know, Photoshop and then just, you know, shrink things down a little bit in the layer. There's actually quite a lot of work that we need to be done here. I'll keep things simpler for the video, but basically they would need to do a full retape of this and also validation of the chips themselves. So... It's not exactly clear what the timeframes of this would be, but it certainly wouldn't be a couple of weeks. I know I've said this like a trillion times before, but I want to be really, really abundantly clear here. When it comes to products and roadmaps, this is not something they cobble together in a few days. This takes a long time for a product to end up as a physical item that you can actually purchase. Roadmaps exist three to five years in advance, which is kind of one of the things it's very difficult to just change the direction of a ship. As Lisa in, um, uh, from uh, AMD, as well as Jensen Huang from NVIDIA and many others will tell you, they need to make bets, essentially. They need to kind of guess where A, their competitors are going to be in that time frame, but B, what also the industry will need as a whole, which is kind of, um, well, let's just say it, tricky. Ultimately, no one knows whether this is true. I mean, well, I guess technically AMD will uh, know. <laughs> I suppose it will be curious if they decide to make a statement on this. But um, I would take this with lots of grains of salt. It's also very difficult to know what differences it would make to final silicon. Will we see higher clock frequencies than the rumoured speeds? I've heard that Zen 3 would probably have a couple of hundred megahertz, maybe 200, 300 at the absolute limit over what we saw with Zen 2. So if this is the case, are we going to see even higher clock frequencies or are AMD probably just going to, well, double down on... Uh, power consumption and make the chips as efficient as possible. I think that's a good place to leave the story because obviously things are up in the air at the moment but I'll be watching this one like a hawk and I'm very curious if 
uh, AMD does opt to jump straight to 5nm, that would be very interesting and would also leave a lot of questions of what we would see for later architectures and also what would happen in the GPU space with, let's say, RDNA 3. But shifting now to console related stuff, and there's a very interesting post on the official Xbox website, and it actually details what Microsoft's plans are for the next generation in terms of backwards compatibility. And there's a couple of very interesting takeaways here. The first is that Jason Ronald, who is the Director of Program Management for Xbox Series X, has really pushed the fact that Halo Infinite would be the lead game for the console, but also they have 15 studios which are hard at work creating, and I'm going to read this verbatim, the biggest and best lineup of exclusives in Xbox history. We are incredibly excited to show many of the new games in development for Xbox Series X soon. Of course, this tell us up rather well with the fact that we know there's going to be an event in a couple of months which Microsoft will, at least uh, according to their own words, be showing lots of gameplay of titles that they've been creating in-house. I don't think I need to tell anyone that uh, this event is probably going to have the biggest single impact of whether people pre-order the console or not, as after all, the console we know is really powerful, it's a great system, but it really comes down to those games. And obviously, as a PC gamer, predominantly for myself, this also is exciting because at the end of the day, I'll get to experience those games on the PC as well. But let's shift towards backwards compatibility. Personally, I think backwards compatibility is fantastic in terms of Microsoft's legacy with it. There was a lot of skepticism that we would see um, Xbox One be able to play, let's say, Xbox 360 titles, because obviously the architecture is so damn different, and yet Microsoft delivered, and I'm sure you'll agree, it was a great thing. Microsoft got a lot of uh, applause for that, and in my opinion, anyway, it was definitely worth the team's effort. But I'm going to read out a couple of very interesting paragraphs from the official site, as gamers, we also know how important it is to preserve and respect our gaming legacies. Your favourite games and franchises, your progression, your achievements, and the friendships and communities you create through gaming should all move on with you across generations. Not only that, your favourite gaming accessories and peripherals should also move forward as well. Our goal has always been to empower gamers to play the best versions of games from across the four generations of Xbox at the launch of Series X. These principles were key to us from day one and influenced many of our decisions as we started our journey to create our most powerful and compatible console ever. So here is the key, because according to Jason, they've done this a couple of ways. Uh, I'll read it verbatim. To make the Xbox Series X our most compatible console ever required both significant innovation in the design of the custom processor, as well as the unique design of the Xbox operating system and hypervisor at the heart of the next generation platform. With more than 100,000 hours of playtesting already completed, thousands of games are already playable on the Series X today. From the biggest blockbusters to cult classics to fan favourites, many of us in the Xbox team play the Xbox Series X daily as our primary console and switching between generations is seamless. By the time we launch this holiday, the team will have spent well over 200,000 hours ensuring your game's library is ready for you to jump in immediately. Furthermore, it was stressed that games running in backwards compatibility will run natively on the Xbox Series X hardware, so they will have full access to the CPU, GPU, as well as SSD. There is no boost mode here. The system itself does not lower in clock frequency like we believe is happening with the PlayStation 5. Um, although, of course, that's from patents. We don't have an official answer of that yet in terms of how exactly... Uh, backwards compatibility works, and the full power of the Xbox Series X for each and every backwards compatible game. This means that you will have higher frame rates, better visual quality, as well as maximum resolution. Now, naturally, some of this is quite easy to implement because certain games run with un un unlocked frame rate. 
So obviously if the game would sometimes dip to let's say 50 frames a second, then it doesn't really take that much for uh, the game to suddenly run at 60. And also you, of course you have dynamic resolution where a game would dip from let's say 1080p down to 900p but thanks to the higher performance of the gpu in theory anyway we're still going to see uh, 1080p locked but it may not go a higher resolution at least according to the knowledge we have thus far with the exception of games that microsoft put some effort into because at least according to the team here the compatibility team have also invented brand new techniques to enable even more titles to run at higher resolutions and image quality while still respecting the artist's intent and vision we are also creating a new class of innovations to double the frame rate of select titles from 30 fps to 60 or 60 to 120 frames a second Microsoft have a pretty good legacy here because when the Xbox One X debuted, we saw backwards compatibility just be absolutely incredible. For example, games could run up to 4K and they would also have things like anastropic filtering applied to them. So visuals looked way better. And of course, they were also enhanced for Xbox One uh, games as well, which would also see patches for better um, textures or what have you. What's even cooler is if you have a television capable of outputting HDR, high dynamic range, the game can actually have a kind of fake HDR, and um, I'm going to read this verbatim. In partnership with the Xbox Advanced Technology Group, Xbox Series X delivers a new innovative HDR reconstruction technique which enables the platform to automatically add HDR support to games. As this technique is handled by the platform, it allows us to enable HDR with zero impact to the game's performance, and we can also apply it to Xbox 360 and original Xbox titles developed 20 years ago, well before the existence of HDR. Personally, I think that's amazing. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Microsoft does here. Microsoft have had some faults in the past, but I really love the way that they're handling the legacy support of games. When it comes to preservation of games, there's a massive uh, question mark, especially as we're switching to a more digital future, as, well, most of you know. And it's actually one of the reasons that I still buy physical versions of games, for even consoles, because I kind of like just having them sit on my shelf, and I, I guess I am a big fan of uh, game preservation, which is kind of ironic, given obviously I'm a PC enthusiast, so... Ultimately, I've got literally hundreds of games which are sitting in my uh, Steam library, but of course, almost all of those games do still work on Windows 10, albeit with some tweaks here or there. Given Sony will soon be re uh, revealing the PlayStation 5, and obviously Microsoft have several conferences left for the Xbox Series X, I think the next several months in gaming are going to be extremely exciting. I'm also very curious to see what is happening with Lockhart, given there are multiple reports that Lockhart does exist, and developers are still targeting for the lower uh, specification console. But anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video, the normal stuff if you did, like, share, comment and subscribe. We're actually really close now to 70,000 subscribers, which is, quite frankly, amazing. Um, and to be honest with you, rather humbling. If it would be possible, I would ask you share the channel or video with friends and ask them to subscribe because obviously it is a phenomenal way for you to help out the channel. But for now, I'm going to let you all go. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.